to get to that level of simplicity took many, many years. <laughs> it seems like everybody else is making the same rocket. You know, people have to raise, you know, hundreds of billions of dollars and everybody is building Musk's rocket, essentially. Yeah. But we are not doing <laughs> that. We're doing a completely different type of, uh, yeah. uh, of rocket. This week, I talked with Randa Milron, CEO and co-founder of Inner Orbital Systems. She initially comes from a background in journalism and producing international mass media news programs. She went on to co-found Inner Orbital Systems in 1996 and has coordinated several joint research and development projects with the FAA. Internal projects in heat-resistant materials for aircraft, satellite-based ag tech automation, and discovering sustainable solutions to cut down on space junk and pollution from fuels used in aerospace for nearly 30 years. Randa currently takes on the corporate administration, marketing, public relations, and government clearance aspects at interorbital systems, in addition to chemistry experiments. Today we discuss her career transition, her approaches to making sure projects are on budget and on time, and awards won in her time at iOS, including being part of the winning Google Lunar X Prize in 2016 as part of Team Synergy Moon, a launch provider for the team's Neptune rocket. We live in a time where design and technology touch every aspect of our lives. But where did it all come from? Who designed it? How was it built and brought to market? What will it look like in a year? Two years? A hundred years? From the phones and smartwatches that help us in our day to day to the cutting edge spaceships and 3D printers that are leading us into the future, modern design is constantly shaping the way we work, communicate, problem solve, and play. And every new design, big or small, starts with an idea and a bill of materials. I'm Magenta Strongheart, and this is The Bomb, where we talk to leading innovators in the tech world and celebrate the transformational power of design. It was really awesome to visit you guys yesterday at your space and get a little more of a hands-on, um, you know, look at what you're working on. Um, but Glad you what I come. really, yeah, what I really took away from the experience is how you guys are making you know being able to work in space and send things to space much more accessible and it seems like that's a big part of inner orbitals mission yeah yeah and, and i guess uh, you know that was a a requirement you know for us to be able to afford to make uh the types of things that we are making which are mm -hmm. extravagantly expensive in, yeah. in general uh, we we looked at doing this when we first started uh how can we do this with with no budget Mm -hmm. basically and and, and uh, uh, that uh, that's how it evolved into what it is now it was that mentality to strip away all non-essential components of uh, like traditional rocket engines uh, like we don't use turbo pumps we use mm -hmm. a pressure method uh, but a turbo pump is like you know millions of dollars to develop right and can be um, uh, you know Failure prone. So we wanted to remove all failure prone systems. My husband, Rod, who's the CTO and co-founder of, of Interorbital, uh, was always in aerospace. He was an aerospace engineer for many years at Grumman in New York mm -hmm. and in General Dynamics here in, in California. But uh, we, at, through our music connections, met some people who were working with the Pacific Rocket Society and said, you have to come out to the desert and see the stuff. Well, we, we had always loved, you know, the Apollo program and everything to do with space and, mm -hmm. you know, thought, you know, science, man, that's the highest form of romance, right? <laughs> so, uh, we got involved with the Pacific Rocket Society. Uh, we, we just decided one day, okay, we're going to start, we're going to do this thing. I remember making our first engine and firing the first liquid oxygen and methanol engine and what a thrill that was. Yeah. <laughs> and, and and I remember saying to Rod, so what had happened if we just kept this up and take over the industry like the, within a decade or so, you mm -hmm. know, uh, you know, some wild fantasy, right? Yeah. But it does seem that that might happen because we've developed a rocket that is the world's least expensive and uh, it'll basically tear the bottom out of the price structure of current launch. Yeah. Yeah. That's going to be so incredible. And you guys are shooting and you can tell me of course if any of this is off limits mm -hmm. we can edit it out but you guys are shooting for um a 2024 launch right yeah at this point i'd say that's a that's the best realistic uh figure unless uh, something drastically changes and somebody mm -hmm. drops off a 
a ton of money at our front door. <laughs> uh, uh, we'd thought possibly the end of this year, but I think more realistically, 2024. Mm -hmm. But um, you know, we we make we make the rockets, and we also make satellites, mm -hmm. and we've been funding ourselves or bootstrapping by uh, uh, selling the satellite kits. We have CubeSats, little tiny, you know, kind of Kleenex size yeah. box items. Uh, and uh, TubeSats and CubeSats and TubeSats are our form factor, our, our invention. But we sell those to basically everybody. We have them in 25 countries at least. Wow. Uh, we have uh, nearly 200 customers. Uh, they vary from you know, mostly academic through NASA mm -hmm. and large corporations, advertising projects, uh, all sorts of fantastic uses. What's the most interesting thing you've seen that someone wants to put in the satellite? Probably the like the group of eleven year olds who uh, <laughs> who uh, sent up their their tube sat, which was our first piece of space hardware, went up on a Japanese rocket, mm -hmm. and just the fact that it was like eleven year olds who did that, and they they sent out a message of peace, right? To oh, this and said the kids hi to the world. The and, <laughs> yeah. and, you know, this is so fantastic that yeah. so you know. Um, might not have been the most technically challenging, but to start that at 11, I would have mm -hmm. killed for that. You know, yeah. <laughs> that chance, yeah, you know, the they, kind of, I can make a satellite and actually send it to orbit. Totally. The idea is that can open up for Yeah, so we, we felt that was, that was empowering, not only for them, but for us as well. It was, it was exciting. Absolutely. Uh, there are all sorts of uh, uh, projects. People have um, uh, sent up a, uh, test launch of a of John Frusciante's um, an album release <laughs> from the Red Hot Chili Peppers mm -hmm. and and uh, that uh, you know with that space you know kind of uh, space branding that that whole project had uh, you know won at Cannes many prizes in the advertising world from that was in 2014 but that was pretty fantastic and. It was quoted in Rolling Stone and nice. all, all, sorts, awesome. all sorts of cool things. That's came bringing from all that. your worlds together too in a fun and it way. It certainly <laughs> did. Yeah, that was that was pretty wild. So um, you know, and, and most of those things are on you know on our website or YouTube of the you know those launches. So we've 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 achieved a lot with um, yeah again what would be, what would be considered uh, no budget in the yeah. general industry, mm -hmm. and and maybe that's coming out of the. You know, the whole ethos of, um, you know, the uh, no budget filmmaker <laughs> yeah. uh, in all of us. Yeah. But you do the it DIY anyway. Spirit. You mm -hmm. just, you just, you just forge ahead. You move, you move ahead and you, you do whatever is required to make it happen. Yeah, totally. So, uh, <laughs> and, and in many cases, uh, that meant to innovate or, or find some way to work within a, you know, a capital constrained mm -hmm. environment. Building your own machines, which we saw a lot of yesterday, we do, we which do. is really interesting. If, if we can't afford to buy it, we make it. <laughs> yeah. You all are working on a pick in place <laughs> right now. That was fun to discuss. Yeah. And uh, we got to see some other interesting, when we were talking about our heat press here, you guys have experimented in that realm as mm -hmm. well. Um, and then also in what you were saying about being able to utilize off the shelf parts, which I think is something a lot of our, you know, um, Hackaday community members can really relate to because, uh, right. like you said, as soon as you add a uh, aerospace to it, the the price tag goes yeah, up. Many a few zeros, zeros are, right? <laughs> uh, follow with that. that yeah. it's, it's actually true, and and um, I think to have the um, maybe it's the bravery. I don't know to actually take components from other industries and use them in an aerospace application. Yeah, yeah, that. It's up to you to judge whether that's going to work or that it's going to be strong enough. Uh, and again, that a big rocket challenge is, is it strong enough and is it light enough? You know, there's that delicate mm -hmm. balance. But we found that we can, um, you know, in addition to making all the major components ourselves, like all the engines, all the, the guidance system, you know, rocket tankage, everything along those lines. So, uh, you know, that that's that's essential. But there are the small things that you can buy and you can use, um, you know, different types of uh, valves and off the shelf components that helps, um, you know, keep the overall cost down. And again, that was that whole COTS movement, you know, commercial off the shelf components 
that um, could be adapted. I, I see um, there's a move, you know, with government rocket projects, at least to want to try to take the cost down. So we have the solution. You know, we've, we've made we've made a rocket that they've asked for maybe yeah ten years ago, I think, and mm-hmm. nobody was able to produce it for the the cost that they were stipulating, which was you know a launch to orbit, I think forty kilograms or something like that. Uh, for under a million dollars, mm-hmm. so we've we've created that rocket, yeah, and that's the one that will be debuting in twenty twenty four. And I was going to ask, so is there anything you can tell us about what's going on to the the launch for twenty twenty four? We have uh, we have about two hundred two hundred different payloads to choose from, and it wow. depends on who's ready, mm-hmm. you know, because we'll be able to launch multiple uh, satellites on on each of these each of these rockets, and uh, they're they're again they're tiny satellites so uh, somewhere between 30 and 150 depending on which version of the rocket we use mm-hmm. uh, it can be launched in in a timed sequence and um i would estimate probably on the first launch somewhere around 50 is what i would think that's gonna be so awesome it's gonna be cool <laughs> it's gonna be a crowded uh, yeah. <laughs> launch day right? right and that's the one you guys are planning on um launching in the water Potentially, uh, well, from uh, actually from a barge, very likely. Okay. We have a we have a unique. Um, it's another way you guys are saving. We, saving we costs. are yeah. we are because if you go to uh, to one of the federal spaceports, uh, there are huge costs associated with them. Generally, you know, millions of dollars, you know, additional money for uh, all sorts of things that they come up with right? <laughs> uh, but um we're looking at um doing the the barge launch uh off the coast of california initially uh with a polar orbit you know launching south over the south pole north pole you know kind of a an orbit and um that's actually very cost effective because we don't have to we it also keeps our insurance down because we're away from uh, a lot of government infrastructure, which you find at um, various you know, these these uh, you know space ports, have mm-hmm. that. That's ne- a necessity. But um, again, that becomes a liability in terms of uh, what we could destroy if the rocket malfunctions. So, mm-hmm. um, in order to uh, again to keep the costs down, going out to sea is uh, is freedom. Mm-hmm. You know, and uh, no matter where we launch in the world, we need a U.S. launch license. So, you know, where we can. And with that, we can go to, again, anywhere there's water and it's, you know, friendly zone and give customers a different, um, a different inclination or a different angle of launch mm-hmm. if required. Wow. Okay. Uh, we also have a completely mobile uh, land launch system that so you can drive to a location and then uh, tilt up and launch. Yeah. Our rockets are made to launch with no infrastructure and completely Make it sound austere. so simple. <laughs> Just drive it up and tilt it the well, way you want, and there you go. <laughs> to get to that level of simplicity took many, of many years. Yeah. <laughs> uh, to be able to uh, Spartanize everything uh, was was uh, was tough. It seems like everybody else is making the same rocket. You know, people have to raise you know hundreds of billions of dollars, and and then um, you know everybody is building Musk's rocket essentially. Yeah, we are not doing that. We're doing a completely different type of, uh, yeah. uh, of rocket. Uh, uh, inspired a lot by um, uh, by Lutz Kaiser's work at Otrog, a German uh, who had the first uh, uh, commercial launch company in the world, Otrog. Okay, and, uh, wow. And he was working with us for a while when he found out the types of propellants we were using and what yeah. we were up to. So we had the luxury of having uh, having Lutz work with us. It was great. Yeah. Uh, but um, you know, and again, we do stand on the shoulders of giants like those people: Ernest von Braun, Lutz Kaiser. Mm-hmm. Uh, it's thrilling work. It's um, it's work that uh, that has meaning. You know, it'll it'll open up uh, space access for people who couldn't even think about doing. On right. orbit research, uh, and our small satellites give people uh, the um, the tools they need to potentially start their own satellite companies mm-hmm. and uh, enter the 
you know, the exciting field of space. What can yeah. I say? Yeah, you know, get it's, a taste. It's, it's <laughs> super. You know, it's exciting. It's sexy, as people say. It's it's, uh, it's yeah, the best. You shared a really um, beautiful kind of end goal fantasy with us yesterday. <laughs> Would you be willing to share that with our audience? <laughs> yeah, yeah. My my goal is to be able to uh, you know have a have a nice uh, nice espresso they're sitting at my moon base and watching <laughs> the earth rise yeah. mm -hmm. so that is actually the main goal of interorbital is to set up a, a transportation system between earth and moon that will enable a, a lunar base for both uh, research and tourism mm -hmm. uh, so that that is uh, uh, it's required you know and and it's the logical place for a space station mm -hmm. uh, when you you know you always have to Current International Space Station always has to be boosted and all sorts of maintenance has to be done on that. If you take it to the moon and you put it there, it's just, you know, it's logical. It's, you have resources there. You have uh, uh, some tiny bit of gravity, but yeah. there are some aspects that, you know, just make it the right spot. Yeah. What kind of like clearance or like, you know, you said you need to get a, uh, U.S. license to launch for the rockets, but for um, making a station on the moon, do you what kind of paperwork does that entail? <laughs> uh, to be determined. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> uh, a lot. I, there's there are a lot of organizations uh, internationally that would be involved in that. Mm -hmm. uh, it's UN. Uh, the FAA is taking taking some, and the Office of Commercial Space Transportation are, you know, uh, starting to move in the direction of of. Uh, helping to facilitate that mm -hmm. uh, so we'll see how that works but uh, as it as it approaches you know in terms of um, uh, having those launches become a reality uh getting the getting the paperwork done will be uh, you know will be probably a formidable task one yeah. never knows <laughs> but uh, could be big part of the process definitely yeah it's interesting to think as um more and more private institutions are getting involved um, in this space. Like we were just talking to an um, uh, investor in San Francisco who's, you know, working with a few companies starting to get into um, space technology and kind of the, the supporting infrastructure that is starting to develop and to think about, you know, what is this ecosystem that's growing, um, you know, beyond our planet <laughs> right. uh, that so many companies are going to start to get more and more involved in, you know, because it's not just um, the rockets or the spacecrafts or the stations. It's all the, like one of the um, companies she was talking about is working on managing kind of the space waste um, and tracking the debris. those things. Yeah, yeah exactly. Yeah. And so it's, it's interesting danger. to kind of think about, yeah, mm -hmm. just how much more support is going to be needed and then thus how many opportunities for other right. um, yeah. ideas and companies to get involved. We've, uh, you know, we've looked at that in terms of our business plan uh, and we we settled on having our small satellites be in, a, in an orbit that decays rapidly so that these, these spacecraft will do their do their work and then fall out of orbit and burn up. Mm -hmm. So it's just kind of a self-cleaning oven. Yeah. <laughs> but we don't like space yeah. debris either because we intend to go, you know, beyond low earth orbit and, um, you know, want a giant barrier there. Right. Right. So uh, these are things that, uh, I mean, there are a lot of suggestions now in, in play that you should have a deorbiting capability on, satellites that are going to be up for a certain amount of years and, and you know after you exceed that limit you have to be able to bring them back and not just leave the trash there mm -hmm. essentially uh but the um but because our our goals are beyond leo or low earth orbit uh and uh i guess in the in the near future lunar eventually other locations like cloud cities of venus mm -hmm. that sort of stuff <laughs> Uh, but there are there are many places in the solar system that we would like to go, mm -hmm. or at least you know begin to make that uh, railroad essentially you know to the to the various points those mm -hmm. destinations, uh, and somebody's got to do it right. So yeah. it, in our case, making a, a rocket that's uh, the most affordable will facilitate a lot of that. It'll, it'll help to generate uh, wealth in terms of like mining space mining, mm -hmm. a variety of other, you know, applications. But right now the missing component is to find a rocket that is 
uh, affordable enough to uh, help those business cases along. In the case of our Neptune and Scepter and Triton rockets, which are the progressively and Triton heavy, uh, progressively larger and more um, capable uh, cargo vehicles, both cargo and humans. Mm -hmm. it, it, this is, uh, you know, this is something that has been the missing component. So by by injecting those into the market, I think it's going to set off a whole revolution of, of uh, you know, like a new gold rush. Uh, yeah. People, people <laughs> jumping into something that they already find attractive, but maybe can't think about affording. You know? yeah. they, it's not possible for them currently, but it, it will be. Yeah. I love that you guys are the the hacker rebels of the space, <laughs> <laughs> the space race. <laughs> I know we love it too. It's you know? really we like love the role. <laughs> yeah, honestly, it really ties in well with, like I was saying, kind of the the different ends of of um, who we work with and <laughs> uh, and our communities as well. So um, I think it's really exciting to think about all those different angles. You know mm -hmm. how to get into um, this industry, and uh, what we saw also a lot of yesterday was just how lean of a team you guys run and operate and a big part of that you know we we're discussing similar to we have a pretty small team here everyone kind of has to be a utility player and i'd love to hear you kind of talk through how so much of your previous you know careers and um range of work that you did before starting this company has you know supported what you guys are working on now from you know your wearing, I think, a lot of hats, business development, marketing, but also chemist and working on these, you know, chemical composites and all of that. So would love to have you illustrate that a little bit for us. Yeah, it, you know, I guess it comes out of uh, maybe out of working in, in television and in, in having a, a um, small team that does the essential work and then, you know, gets the product out. Mm -hmm. uh, you you rely on everybody to be able to do everything essentially you know interchangeable components to that team and that works uh, for us uh, keeping it lean was was a conscious choice because we've seen other companies come and go I mean we, we're based at the Mojave Air and Spaceport and we've seen countless space companies come through and fail and go bankrupt disappear run away the money and whatever mm -hmm. yeah. but that is uh, you know that we didn't want that fate, you know, we wanted to make sure that we were doing something that was sustainable and, you know, and, and would produce uh, the, the required uh, uh, tools to, to do space transportation on a, on a budget. You know, so it was a, um, again, a conscious choice. And I, I think of an, an experience I had, and this is kind of weird, but um, it was, um, we were in a mall near San Francisco, I think it was called the Sarah Monte. I know the Saramonte Mall, okay. yeah, very well. <laughs> and in, the, in the corner were three guys at a card, little card table that they had set up in the hallway, like they had just hijacked the space. Mm -hmm. And they had their computers sitting on it. And one of them was Steve Jobs. No way. <laughs> and Steve Wozniak and another person, I don't know, but. Wow. They, you know, they were selling their, they were selling mm -hmm. their computers. And on did this. you know them at the time? Yeah, like we, you recognized I mean, we, them? We knew that they were who they were mm -hmm. in terms of the they were making these first personal computers yeah. which were far far beyond uh, far beyond our uh, our capability to purchase mm -hmm. uh, at the time uh, because they were um, at that time computers were incredibly expensive not affordable <laughs> but um, you know totally unique and totally desirable but i saw that you know we, we talked with them for quite a while and i saw that small team that they were and you know what they became yeah right? <laughs> no secret there but that and and i always use steve's quote that you know that small a plus team is going to run circles around a large b or c team mm -hmm. and that's what we've 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 got it you know we've distilled that down to yeah to quality the, over quantity we, right right and that that i think has kept us alive over the you know more than two decades that we've been working and we've done all the requisite R and D that we need to do to make this happen over that length of time. Uh, many companies fail. You know, they might succeed at getting, you know, some massive amount of money initially, but they're still amateur rocketeers just starting mm -hmm. out in most cases. So to to see that um, to see that uh, repeat over and over again, well, they'll get the money. They'll hire hundreds of people. They'll build buildings. You know, <laughs> things that before. 
attacking the you know the real R and D that's yeah. required. So we thought that's not that's not prudent. That's not correct. You know, we're going to do it this way, where we build tech technology milestones and and uh, you know fly these rockets. You know, make mm -hmm. the engines fly the fly the rockets. And we've done uh, all we can do at this point with uh, you know this again this small budget, but it is. Uh, it's almost intentional. Like we we said, we're not gonna we're not gonna exceed these costs. We're not gonna go there. We're not gonna do what they did. We're mm -hmm. not gonna fail like that. Let's see how cheaply we can make this thing, you know, but still make it robust and still make it work mm -hmm. effective. Yeah, yeah, and, and 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 that has come to pass. Yeah. What would you say has been the most challenging uh, part of of the last? You know. 20 years, as you mentioned, well, so of developing just, this. It, it, you know, the development is, is difficult, but it, but it just, you know, it, in, in our case, it, it's, it's paid off, uh, you know, with, with success and flying both stages of uh, independently of the, uh, of the uh, orbital launch vehicle. So uh, we've, we've gotten through that, mm -hmm. but I guess may, maybe trying to uh, maybe get contracts that, uh, pay our way a little more easily you know mm -hmm. getting larger larger contracts so we've been working with a couple of companies you know doing some engineering work and uh test flight work and we were, we just finished a project with paragon space development that was great working with them and with some strategic partnerships so that's mm -hmm. that's working out but um i think to uh start uh selling the the lunar missions would be the way to go for what we're what we're up to uh because our our again our goals are you know hugely expensive but to do something like that uh we do require partners so so we look around for that that sort of thing but uh but a small team mm -hmm. has to start it yeah they have to start the the basics yeah then you expand I'd love to go back to what you were um, describing about uh, some of the satellites that you have mm -hmm. gotten into orbit are um, flew up on a Japanese rocket. Mm -hmm. You said, could you tell us a little bit about that partnership and how well, that well, happened? That, was, uh, that actually went through, uh, it was a Brazilian um, elementary school. They're, they're very aggressive, uh, very, uh, you know, heavily, heavily involved with, uh, you know, the promotion of their their citizens and their, you know, their involvement with new technologies. So the, these this group of teachers just took it upon themselves to work uh, in their classroom with their space agency as mentors mm -hmm. and and make this thing happen. So they're pretty much as aggressive as we were. So, yeah, <laughs> and it was great working with them. They they wrangled a they wrangled a launch on on a I think it was an H two rocket. A Japanese rocket, and I think it's a traditional partnership between J Japan and Brazil. Mm -hmm. Anyway, and again, it was their 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 dedication, their sincerity. They, you know, the path was cleared for them because of their persistence, right? Mm -hmm. And um, uh, that, you know, that that was remarkable to see that happen. That they um, they just they weren't going to take no for an uh, they answer, weren't. <laughs> and, and uh, you know, they I. I I don't think I've ever seen a group of people more involved would have teleconferences with all the parents of all the children, mm -hmm. you know, working and, and, uh, and, um, uh, just, just an amazing group. They, they had competitions with the people in the classes, right. Who, who built this, the best uh, mock-up of the satellite got to build the actual satellite. And then that team was brought up to the U S they visited us at the lab so awesome. as well. Yeah. And it's like, Jeez, you know, this is like, this should be a model for like every mm -hmm. country. Yeah. You know, follow the Brazilian model yeah. called a Ten Credo uh, Middle School, I mm -hmm. believe they were. But uh, I have an eleven-year-old brother, so I'm just thinking how like mind-blowing that would be for him to be involved that, in yeah. something well, like that. Like I, I that'd be thinking, awesome. <laughs> why wasn't I yeah. offered this? You know, <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> when I was eleven, it would have. Well, I don't know if it would have changed my life because <laughs> still be doing this. Yeah, but, uh, it. Um, maybe would have happened sooner. Mm -hmm. And uh, what are you kind of most excited about that's on the horizon for you all at, at Interorbital, this upcoming launch or even beyond that, D developing the, the passenger vehicles? Doing the orbital vehicles. launch, doing the first, the first orbital launch and, and deploying, uh, you know, the 
uh, clearing some of our manifest. Mm -hmm. If you look on the website and look at the manifest, <laughs> yeah, frames of checking some of those boxes there, up. Yeah, yeah. it's really uh, pretty exciting. So to to uh, be the enabler for that is mm -hmm. is uh, is pretty exciting. But uh, just the just the fire and thunder <laughs> of the whole rocket mm -hmm. uh, world, you know, yeah. doing rocket engine firings, rocket launches is it's you know it's beyond description in terms of the power you know yeah. you have that power working for you so you know how fantastic is that mm -hmm. yeah would you say that's what's like kept you inspired yeah in the, always in the, the we're all addicts yeah <laughs> <laughs> yeah exploding that engine every time yeah, it's like, yeah we always say it's like you know, the, you know eight seconds of terror there and then then you know some relief when it's things worth actually the, work the yeah. years of yeah. development yeah, yeah. And um, I wanted to ask about the software side of things. Um, I know with your rockets, once they go up, they control themselves. There's um, they're basically giant robots. Mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah. yeah, and you guys are also going to have, in theory, for the or you know the idea is that for the um, passenger vehicles, it would also be autonomously mm -hmm. um, controlled, yeah. right? Once yeah. they're deployed, uh, do you guys develop that software yes. in house? Yes everything everything critical is done in-house we don't you know, something like that we don't feel comfortable tr trusting to an outsourced mm -hmm. you know kind of a vendor i mean it just like it's it's kind of your brain right of you know, the brain of your 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 uh, main product you don't mm -hmm. want controlled by someone else also you don't want to be held hostage by somebody who might be supplying that part and then they decide, well, okay, we're going to charge an extra million for that or mm -hmm. something, you know. Or it disappears or, or something. Or, <laughs> or even worse, they go out of business, right? And we've seen that happen. We've had, to, over the last uh, couple of years, we've had to deal with uh, you know, supply chain shortages and, mm -hmm. uh, you know, like giant like so lead times people, on yeah. components. And that's not unique for us. It's, you know, across the board. But, you know, that teaches you that, uh, you know, be self-reliant basically, mm -hmm. and make as much as you can in terms of, uh, uh, you know, whatever your, you know, your core, your core, your core goals are, your core product, what those needs are to, to make that happen. Yeah, definitely. And what would you say is the most uh, inspiring thing in tech for you right now? Mm. Uh, you know, uh, is there anything outside of what you're working on that you get inspired regularly from? Well, I like, uh, like CRISPR. <laughs> okay. Uh, I like biotech and, mm -hmm. and that's something that our company will have a, I a saw division for that. Yes. That you guys were interested yeah. in plant-based food production and yeah. some other. Like a giant uh, like set of recipes yeah. already <laughs> developed right for that. And also, uh, so the whole line of food and, and the whole line of, uh, uh, you know, space-based agriculture mm -hmm. that we're working with some people on that. That's really interesting. But it's it's needed. You, you already have spin-off companies ready for the yeah. future. <laughs> yeah, we have probably about 15 of them, I think, <laughs> at this point. And uh, that's, um, uh, uh, just speaking of spin-off companies, uh, we do have a, also have a, a 501c3, uh, uh, which is a translunar research, and that's mm -hmm. dedicated for moon base and uh, actually ex exploration and colonization of all the moons in the solar system wow. so <laughs> just an aside <laughs> yeah just a little little side project <laughs> because again because it's going to be so so incredibly expensive to mm -hmm. to make these projects happen and we want them to to be revenue generating as well you know like again like mining and other other uh, mm -hmm. uh, to be know, able to support the continued like yeah research ventures, and development but they mm -hmm. should yeah and that's how we've run inner orbital and uh, you know it, it it is a company that generates money and that that differentiates us in a, in a way because not all the companies who maybe say brought in all the vc funds and that sort of stuff have the ability to generate anything yeah well, you know who knows <laughs> so maybe maybe our little you know modest model will actually work yeah. better I yeah mean. i mean i'm excited to to follow along your journey and so excited that we've gotten introduced to you all and um okay we just have a couple questions left here what is one thing outside of technology that's inspiring you i kind of like the level that that all of the uh the, that the internet has reached and it, it allows us you know to be on a level playing field with any media mm -hmm. source 
or or generator out there. Yeah. So we can, you know, whether it's like, you know, NBC or whatever. Mm-hmm. And yeah, coming can, from a newscasting background, yeah, like we can it's, just we can enter we can enter the we can enter <laughs> the stream as it were, mm-hmm. and and you know, have our ideas come across just mm-hmm. with the same ability as those folks. So I, I like I like that. That's it's an exciting time in terms of that. Mm-hmm. No, that's a great way to to frame it. And last but not least, we always ask our guests, what is on your personal bill of materials? <laughs> I guess the moon base. The moon base. <laughs> yeah. yeah. I'll order that. One moon base to yeah. go, please. <laughs> there you go. So. Okay. <laughs> Love that. That's a unique answer. We haven't heard that yet. So I almost want to make a make a t-shirt with that one. <laughs> <laughs> awesome. Well, thank you so much, Randa. It was really amazing Thanks, to Magenta. hear about your background and how you're incorporating it into this incredible work that Inner Orbital is doing. And really excited, as I mentioned, to follow along your journey and hopefully have Design Lab involved in some small parts. Absolutely. Part, so. Looking forward to it. Thank you, Randa, for sharing your experience and insights on pivoting industries, latest developments in aerospace engineering, and ensuring sustainable budgets and practices are maintained from concept to completion. Interorbital Systems currently has several works in progress in aerospace hardware, software, and general tech including plant-based food production and possibly agricultural production in zero-gravity environments. A link to their website can be found in the show notes. Until next time, here's to the next conversation. If you like The Bomb, don't forget to subscribe, rate, and share the show wherever you get your podcasts. You can follow Supply Frame and Hackaday on Instagram, Twitter, LinkedIn, YouTube, and Design Lab at Supply Frame Design Lab on Instagram and Twitter. The Bomb is a Supply Frame podcast produced by me, Magenta Strongheart, and Ryan Tillotson. Written by Maggie Bulls and edited by Daniel Ferreira. Theme music is by Anna Hogben. Show art by Thomas Schneider. Special thanks to Giovanni Salinas, Bruce Dominguez, Thomas Woodward, Jin Kumar, Jordan Clark, the entire Supply Frame team, and you, our wonderful listeners. I'm your host, Magenta Strongheart. See you next week.